Blue Chocolate Escapade, Team Tam Sweets, Chef Sala Senorita. Hello. Good evening, good evening, good evening. I think we'll wait for it, a few more people to join. Um, where's everybody from, anyway? Just while you're all here. Where's everybody from? From Lisbon in Northern Ireland, uh, we've got people from Iran, hello, good evening, Canada, wow. Okay. Hi Sammy from Iran, Mother Baker, hello. Who's got questions then? Because what I was going to do is talk about spraying. I, so I did a live, I did a live, uh, I think last week, and it threw up lots of, of um, compressor questions. And what's I, I do a lot of one-to-one -one training. And what's very obvious to me, everybody talks about um, prepping the molds, polishing them. Um, talk about tempering the chocolate, we talk about tempering cocoa butter, we talk about uh, spray brushes and pressures you've got to spray and all the rest of it. Nobody really actually has a discussion about um, how to set up some of the controls for your, your actual compressor. Because very often what I see students do, or the one-to-ones I do, what I see is they literally plug, plug the hose in plug the hose in, turn it on, and um, start spraying. And then they get lots of vapor, and then they have lots of problems, and they don't know about the controls. And I suppose what I really wanted to do is um, maybe go through some of that um, and and answer those questions. So let's see if there's anything come up yet in terms of questions. Everybody's being shy, aren't they? So, show me the chocolate you use, also give me details of which chocolate is best for pralines. Um, I use uh, I use two brands, I use, actually I use three brands. I use Casa Luca, I use uh, Valrona, and I use Calibert. Calibert is probably the one that I use the most because I can I can actually get, I can actually purchase it the easiest. Um, I can, you know, I can go to a big superstore and um, they've got the £10 bags, they've got... Um, the whole range of what I'm kind of looking for. Uh, so I use that for shelling, I also use that for fillings. Um, in terms of the best one, they're all good. It depends what you're trying to achieve. I've got, you know, there's a 70% here. Um, there's a 70% here, which is really, I think, got a lovely flavour, but the problem is it's only two drop, right? So if I try shelling with that, I'm gonna end up with shells so thick um, be like, <laughs> be like biting on the Toblerone. So, I think you you need a chocolate that's a three drop for shelling, um, and then I don't think the I don't think the fluidity, so the number of drops, I don't think that's important so much for your filling as long as your filling is is balanced. Different flavors, different um, flavor notes, different kind of the terroir. I think the French call it, but. Each region has its own subtlety in terms of whether it's floral, whether it's spicy, whether it's kind of got that earthy feel, whether it's dark fruits, whether it's, you know, I don't know if there's a, the best one for pralines. I think choose the chocolate that you like that pairs with 
what it is that you're trying to achieve, if that answers that. Um, what else have we got? Um, can I do a live on Golden Calibre and Ruby, um, as I'd love to use those for mold chocolates? Right, the, the Golden Chocolate, so the Golden Calibre, I love that it's caramelized. Um, I make my own. I you know I just spread out the white chocolate on a on a silpat mat, and it goes in the oven at eighty degrees. Um, the ruby, <clears throat> the ruby. If I'm honest, I'm um, I'm not a huge fan. Um, it, it turns grey, and I, I I don't know. Do you know I I've not found a way. You know, if I use it in fillings, the colour changes in it, so that's a problem. And I don't want to start putting colorings into fillings I don't want to put colorings in fillings I think doing things natural is is always been the way for me um, I use different sugars um, admittedly and I use sorbitol and I use things that will just extend shelf life but I don't really like using colorings um, and with the ruby chocolate although it's natural when you cook it or you apply heat to it it, it kind of goes a little bit gray for me so the ruby not a huge fan of the golden one the caramelized one love it it's just um it's really it's really warming and i think it lends itself like the white chocolate i think it or the w2 like it, it lends itself to so many so many flavor combinations it's great with spices it's great with red fruits it's good with citrus fruits as well certainly when you get into the realms of some of the um perfume fruits like mango or passion fruit it's fantastic so um but you know, if you want to use it, grab a bag and have a go. And you know, my experience is, you know, it doesn't really work for me for what I'm doing, for what I'm selling, for the market that I make for. Um, it's certainly very interesting. It's not been around long. The ruby chocolate. It looks beautiful when it comes out of the bag. It's just when I go to use it, it, it changes a little bit for me. So um, that's that's a challenge. I hope that answers that one for you. Uh, Mother Baker, yeah, I hope that answers that one for you. Uh, the golden, yeah, as I said, I love it. I think, um, you know, I, use the product that you, you know, use the product that you want. There's no rules, there's no, you know, there's nobody saying you can't, you can't do that. I think what you need to do is explore your own, um, your own style, and you know, do you not know do your own thing? Definitely do your own thing. What other questions have we got? Okay, when you purchase, um, so this is a chocolate escapade. When you purchase um, premise coloured cocoa butter, do you add plain cocoa butter when spraying with an airbrush? No, I don't. I use. Um, Get one that you can see. Right, I use <clears throat> the majority of what I use is IBC. I've got some, I've got Chef Rubber, I've got Roxy and Rich, I've got uh, a few other kind of brands. Um, I don't add anything to them. I literally, I mean, these are these are really really well made. The ingredients list, um, you know, and the controls behind. Uh, the manufacture of them they're very very accurate and they're very very consistent um, there's no need to thin them down it is only cocoa butter anyway if I added cocoa butter to it, it it wouldn't change the fluidity of it it wouldn't make it thicker or thinner so there'd be no advantage really to thin it down um, to put it through an airbrush cocoa butter regardless of the brand regardless of you know the origin they're very very similar in, in fluidity so um, and the fluidity is, you know, I mean the runniness of it. So once it's melted, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty consistent across many, many ranges. So what does change is how much uh, colour pigment is in there, how much fat-soluble colour pigment's in there. So I do find that the darker colours like black, blue, red, uh, certainly those big prime colours, the darker they are, the more pigment I think is in them and... I need to spray just a few, you know, I might spray white at 45 PSI, but I find that, you know, if I'm using black or blue is my big one. If I'm spraying blue, I just need to turn the pressure up by kind of five, five pounds. Um, so I'm spraying at 50, 52, 54 PSI. 
uh, I find it comes out a little bit more consistent for me for that. Um, don't yeah, I mean to answer that one, I don't, I don't, I don't add anything to to I don't add any cocoa butter to it. What I do do though is I will mix. Um, I'll take the standard blue that I've got and I'll add some white to it just to thin it down a little bit. And where I'm doing, if I'm doing swirls. I'll put blue in there and I'll put white in there. I'll put blue in there and swirl it around, put white in there and, and, and swirl it around. Then I'll mix blue and white separately in a, a little silicone pot and then I'll smear that one in and it gives me uh, gives me a lovely kind of marbled uh, effect. So I do, I do, uh, um, red is another one actually. Red, um, the one that I got from IBC is flame red, but what I'll do is I'll add a few drops of black to it and it just gives it a darker, uh, a much darker kind of hue that when you you know when you turn it out so it's not blood red um, but I, you know I think you, you can definitely mix your colors of cocoa butters um, that's not a problem at all and that will give you a unique um, you know that will give you a unique shade of 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 you know color so um, I hope that answers for you what's my favorite filling um, that's a tough one I love salt caramel, um, Malden salt only, without a doubt the best salt in the world. Um, I used to live near Malden and what's really amazing, in Malden where they make the you can't buy, you can't buy the salt, you can only get Cornish salt. Um, I love I love salt caramel, um, I absolutely adore passion fruit, passion fruit and white chocolate as a, as a ganache and I literally do 25% um, passion fruit to 75% white chocolate. Temper the chocolate, add the uh, passion fruit at 40 degrees, uh, stick blender, and do you know what, for, for a 300 gram mix, I'll probably add 20 grams of just salted butter, uh, room temperature, and I'll just blend that in, and that's that's good to go. The easiest, um, the easiest recipe ever, I think passion fruit is lovely. Salt caramel I like. I also like, and this is something I'm leaning towards now, I love spices. Um, I really love spices. I like the mahlab. I like cinnamon. I like, um, you know, ras al is a spice that really goes really, really well with caramel, um, which is the, the Moroccan spice. It just means top of the drawer. It's kind of mixed. It's like an all spice. It's a mix of everything. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards just doing a plain dark chocolate ganache with nothing else other than, and it was a comment from a friend that said, you know, just do a chocolate one. Why does it have to have all this um, stuff? And actually, do you know, it's an interesting point. People are buying chocolate. Uh, I may well just do a range that's just filled with uh, a chocolate ganache, maybe a milk chocolate ganache, a white chocolate ganache, and a dark one, so that it is just chocolate, not other spices. So um, I hope that answers that one for you. Um, Mother Baker uses the Calibut sing single origin. Yeah. Um, I like caliber. I know you know it's a, it's a bit of a swear word. You know there was a, there was a guy I was talking to recently who was like, well, I only use Valrona and I only use you know this one and um, each their own man. I, you know whatever you want to use, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you are consistent with as well. Um, and I think chocolate. You know they behave. Um, you know Coca Barry have one called Inaya, uh, which is I think it's a sixty four percent and it's really really elastic. It's really elasticy. Um, I absolutely adore it, but to use it in a ganache is just, it just doesn't behave. And as much as I love it, and it's two drop as well, so trying to do shells with it, it's, you know, it, it's hard work. Um, you need to raise the temperature a little bit, and there's a danger that it's out of temper, and uh, just then, as you know, if you make chocolate, as soon as you start playing with those temperatures to get the fluidity different, um, one thing creates another problem, and it's catalytic. It's just, you know, one tiny little mistake, down the road you end up with bonbons that are for you to eat, ones that you can't sell. Um, single origin, yeah, absolutely love it. Um, yeah, there's some there's some really nice stuff out there actually. Um, who else? Leslie, you're loving the gold. Yeah, it's a nice chocolate actually. It's just a lovely warming. For anybody that remembers, there used to be a chocolate bar called a Caramac uh, and it reminds me of that and I, I don't eat as much chocolate as uh, most people think I don't. I, I taste the fillings. Um, for all that you're making chocolate, you, you'll find you know when you started, you're like yum yum yum. Um, as time progresses, you 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 kind of stop eating it. You taste the occasional one. I'll cut them open. I'll have a look at them. 
Um, I don't eat as much. But the, the gold, mm, nom, nom, <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, yeah, definitely have a few of those. Um, the white Zephyr, Zeph, Zephyr by Calibert, it's an amazing, amazing chocolate. Um, you made passion fruit, white chocolate mousse yesterday, the testers. Um, went down very well but you know white chocolate and passion fruit is just it's the acidity it's a perfume fruit but it's the acidity um i had a bonbon at a trade show and it was uh dark chocolate with passion fruit and it didn't do it for me um white chocolate all the way with that one i think um yeah it's all about that so um so posting, how safe would you say to post your chocolate? Temperature outside, Leslie. At the moment, it's a bit of a risk. Um, your The chocolate's going to be safe, the filling isn't. And I would have thought, you know, once you, you today, we've got about 23 degrees, which, you know, there's, I know there's people out there that, you know, are, are working in kind of 40, 42. Um, the shelf life will suffer. Um, what you don't want is air gaps, uh, which is why capping is so important. Um, so you balance this ganache and you put it in there and you get this, you know, it's a little bit soft. You get this water transgression where the water content can move um, microscopically, but it can move and it can almost melt holes in the cap if that's not perfect. I think the biggest problem with posting chocolate when it's warm temperatures, when it's 22, 23 or, or higher is it just doesn't reach the way you sent it and I think that you 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 put you know you put so much effort into making the chocolates and you put them in the boxes and you do your tray papers and you you know you take it to the post office and it gets rattled around and you want to hope that it arrives in the way that you sent it it's no different to my life as a chef you know we we would put things you know on the hot plate and the very least I'd expect somebody to carefully put it in front of the customer the way that I sent it. Um, it's really, really important. It's it's a difficult one, you know. I think there's a lot of chocolatiers have stopped making right now. I have contracts which I have to fulfil, so uh, I'm able to keep them cold. But I, I'm storing all mine in the fridge now. Uh, they go in these, uh, they go in the boxes. Uh, these are just empty shells here. They go in the boxes, they're cling filmed, and then um, I'll store them. I'll store them in the fridge and, until they need to go. Um, I think that's all you can do, really. Um, it is, you know, if, you, if you've got a balance, you know, I think the question, Leslie, you say, how safe is it? Um, it is safe to post them. Obviously, once they've left your premises, you're not really in control of it. Um, so this time of year, yeah, you need to be careful. A 10 day or two week shelf life of a well, you know, let's take for example, salt caramel. Month shelf life, probably really, really safe. If you did the passion fruit um, ganache, which is 25% fruit juice to 75% um, white chocolate. 10 day shelf life, absolute at room temperature. Any more than that, you're gonna get spore growth, you're gonna, you know, possibly you get mildew in chocolates as well, which, which, which you know, can cause all kinds of flavor reactions. Um, it's safe, it is safe, but I would definitely put a warning on the chocolates that, you know, they need to be consumed within five days. Um, as I said before, you know, anybody that can take a, a box of chocolates and make them last more than five days, maybe should be trusted anyway. Uh, but I hope that answers that one, Leslie. Um, what else have we got? Serene is there. Hello, Serene. Um, hello from Portugal. Hello, Portugal. Um, I was going to do this tomorrow night when the football was on because I thought probably just get a bit more, um, get more people. But um, hello from Las Vegas. What else? Um, Molten salt from a salt caramel. I find salt caramel goes well with dark chocolate. Um, yeah, individual actually. Uh, you know, I think salt caramel, I've, I've, I've had very many varieties. In my time that I spent uh, working in France, um, they cook caramel really, really far. Um, almost to the point that it is, uh, it's got burnt undertones. Not, not burnt, but the caramel, they push it a long, long way. And then, you know, there's other friends of mine, other chocolatiers that will make um, 
make a caramel, but make it very, very blonde, so it's very, very sweet. I think the salt content is important. Um, you need a really good sea salt. Uh, I think Maldens is. Pro Mo the nice thing about Maldens salt is you, you know, and I know this from you know my days in restaurants, my days working at Michelin star level. The nice thing about Maldens salt is you can you can over season and it's not offensive. In fact, we use it at home, and when we run out of the big tub, I've got it here. When we run out of it, occasionally happens. I and my wife and I are looking at each other, going, "Oh no, what do we do? We're going to have to use table salt," and it's it's really not a nice thing at all. So. Um, you know, I think I think salt, I think salt caramel, dark chocolate, white chocolate, milk chocolate. It's down to individuals, and I think you know if you're going to do it with the dark chocolate, you don't want to make it too sweet or too blonde, but you don't want to go at the far end of it being caramel, like like hard French caramel. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right, it does. Yeah, it goes. Yeah, I mean it works. Um, that sounds like a good recipe. I'm going to try it. Yeah, go for it. Um, that well, yeah, with the passion fruit. Um, Bring the bring the juice to the boil. Um, you can add to it, you can add um, a percentage of glucose if you want to. Just add some elasticity, and it will help the ganache formulate. Um, but yeah, ten day ten day shelf life. If it's at kind of eighteen degrees, any warmer than that, I would you know I would give it five six days. But you know what, the passion fruit, make them, cap them, eat them, and use fresh passion fruit if you can get them. Right, I know you can get the frozen puree, but um, Occasionally, you find in the shops, you know, they stock the passion fruits. Nobody buys them, and then they put them on, you know, the counter. When they go really wrinkly and they look like nobody would want to buy them, they're the better ones. The ones that are perfectly round and smooth, they're very dry inside, and there's this um, like fur husk on the inside. As it gets older, the outside becomes a little bit more knobbly and a bit more dehydrated, but the inside has more juice in it. So you want to select the ones that are kind of really, really wrinkled, not the ones that are perfectly smooth, kind of egg. So they look like they look like baby aubergines. So, uh, Salma Khalid, how are you, chef? I am really well. I've been I've been doing pastry all week. I've been making macaroons and tartlets. And um, let me show you. Um, I've been making. It's my daughter's birthday tomorrow, so. Uh, 10 years old, so we're doing, she's a, daddy's a chef, so guess what, I've had to make macaroons, eclairs, tartlets, lemon tarts, um, yeah, she's got expensive taste, this is, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to watch this one, so, uh, yeah, I've been making tartlets all day, so, yeah, we're going to have a bit of a soiree tomorrow, and, um, yeah, it's all been pastry, but I'm really good, thank you, I'm really well, how are you? Um, how do you infl infuse flavours in caramel? Uh, when you okay, so there's a there's a phrase called deglazing, right? So, if you made a so a, a straightforward caramel would be equal amounts of heavy cream, or double cream, and uh, sucrose, so sugar. I make a dry caramel. Uh, I make a dry caramel. I don't use water. I use a dry caramel, low heat. If you sprinkle the sugar on, let it caramelize. Once it started to turn, sprinkle some more, or you can put it all in the pan very carefully on the low heat wooden spoon and just chop through it until it turns to a caramel. Biggest tip I can tell you with making caramel is use a pan that's got a stainless steel bottom and you will be able to see the colour of it. If you use a dark pan like this Teflon you won't be able to see how dark it is and then all you're relying on is the smoke coming up and very often they're the ones that go too far. So stainless steel pan. Um, when you when you add the cream to it, what you do is you'd add a percentage of, if it's a liquid, so a fruit juice, you would add that to the cream and boil that and put that in and deglaze it. Be careful your hands. Some of the worst burns I've ever seen in kitchens in 35 years has been because of caramel. Um, they tip it all in. They've got a short whisk about this small. And the steam that's coming off it, uh, probably some of the bur worst burns I think I've ever seen. But um, So that's if you're doing fruit juices. If you were doing spices, I would add the spices in and let that infuse with the cream. No different to how you would do a vanilla pod, right? So um, you'd split, split a vanilla pod, you would put it to steep um, or to infuse in the cream, bring it to the boil and then strain it. I put the spices into there. It's always nice to use whole spices rather than ground spices. Um, much more rounded flavor, I think, with, with, with the whole spices. But you may need to just smash them down a little bit. Um, one of the things you'd infuse into caramel, There's, the spices are the obvious one, fruit juices are the other one. 
Um, I can't think of any other flavours that you do. I'll tell you what I wouldn't do with caramel. You know you can buy these fake flavour drops. Um, I wouldn't do those. Um, they're just a little bit too powerful. They're a little bit too strong, I think, for me. Um, I hope that's it. I just made spice pear passion fruit. Uh, I will see tomorrow how successful it is. Do you know what? Lovely. Love spice pear. Really nice. Actually, I should have done that with these, shouldn't I? Let me put that back in the fridge. Got le lemon tarts in there as well. Um, so, will you teach us how to set up the compressor? Just ordered my Sparmax TC610. Um, really good compressor, that. Really, really. So, setting up your compressor, yeah, let's have a little conversation about that because uh, my experience with spraying wasn't just to do with cocoa butter because I was I'd been, been using airbrushes for probably bass the last 25 years or so. Uh, they are designed for. So these these are designed for spraying ink, which is very very thin. In fact, the majority of the inks that we spray for the art world, you have to buy a thinner and you have to thin them down. Can't do that with cocoa butter. So this is just a technique that's been adapted and pastry chefs are taking it on. It probably came from the from the cake industry where you can buy the edible paints that you can spray. Um, and it was only a short step to actually putting a, a cocoa butter through it and then putting a coloured cocoa butter through it, which is why the majority of us use a 0.8 uh, mil needle. I've sprayed with a 0.1 and it's a bit of a disaster because you get drip. And I know if you watch my IGTV where you can have uh, splatter, uh, the other problem is it's, you know, just at, at, at one mil it just didn't work. So 0.8 is probably a sweet spot for me. Um, Setting up the compressor, yeah, let's just do this quickly. Um, I'll show you on this one. I've got a Sparmax 620 TC. It's, it's in a housing underneath the table down there with the hoses that come back up and up, come up through the model. So this one I'll show you. That one is in a housing, so I can't really show you the bits, but I'll, I'll show you this one. What I said last week is um, hoses, all right? It helps if you have a couple of hoses, all right? I've no idea why they make these two meters long. It would be really handy if these were like 80 centimetres because the less hose there is, the less air pressure loss, right? Um, two hoses would, is, is helpful. And as I said last week, hang them up straight. Don't coil them up. Don't coil them up. Don't leave them in sunlight. Don't put them in the fridge. Don't do silly things with them. I put them on a, I put them on a bulldog clip and I just hang them on the back of a door and uh, it just allows them to dry out. And believe it or not, even though you've got a moisture trap, you will get moisture in here. When these are room temperature and you're blowing cold air through it, you'll get condensation. And it's a tiny amount. But when it's all being blown through from one end to the other, it will come out and it will go in, uh, depending on your, uh, depending on how warm your room is. Um, so, yeah, first thing I'd say, what I, what I showed everybody last week, when you turn this on, before you start spraying, you need to just empty the, well, you need to release any moisture that's built up in here. When you turn it off, all the moisture that's in the system will drop back into this drain and there's a little vent on the bottom there, right? Turn it on, put your finger over the hose, yeah, and then, I can't do it, I can't do it one-handed. You can all see there, all right. If you put your finger over there, and then release that. Do that a couple of times. Do this one. That one's bone dry. <clears throat> Do that because there's a little filament here and then the moisture trap. And these are pretty similar. Of all the models I've seen, of all the different ones I've seen over the years, the moisture trap, this has not really changed at all. All right. So you do that and then then plug your hose in, then plug your hose in. So we're still not spraying. So we release the pressure off that a couple of times. I want to, I want to just put my finger over that before I actually do anything and just let the pressure build up. I'll see that I'm at 50, 55 PSI, which is good. I'll release that out. Then I'll put my warmed airbrush in, right? 
and it's just setting the controls. Right, if I'm spraying, if I'm back spraying, I'm gonna spray at 45 to 50. Like I said, why? I can kind of get away at 45. Uh, works for me. And 45 is about 2.8 bar. Um, three bar, you probably wouldn't be spraying much more than that anyway. Um, dark colors, I sometimes find, certainly some of the thicker colors, right? And, and they're, the, they're the ones that have got more cocoa butter in. Uh, I find that I need to just turn the pressure up to kind of 55 or so. Um, so I'll start it off at 55. I'll always turn the pressure all the way up using the dial and it'll, there's some direction arrows. Very often there's some directional arrows on the top there. Um, so do, turn that up to full pressure. And then as I said, you, you want to spray down onto your tissue, right? Just to see how, how it's coming out. There will be various controls on here as well. So as I unscrew that one, this will come all the way back, right? If I screw this one in, that won't allow this to travel back so far. That is what controls the flow of liquid. The pressure doesn't change. The pressure is changed on the machine. You can't change the pressure with these. So you need to look at your dial and you need to see, as long as your mould, you know I said last week, your mould is kind of between 18 and 20. Um, once you've sprayed, it, a cup, two, it depends on your room temperature, but three or four minutes, your cocoa butter should have dried already. Um, so I think that answers that one for you. Does it? Hope chocolate. But um, if you, I mean, that's, that's Barmax, that TC610 is, is a really, really good, um, it's a really, really good um, compressor, that one. And I think it has the two, it has two outlets for hoses. You can spray with two hoses, don't, right? One of them will be blocked off and, and use the other one, but you will still need to set your um, moisture trap, right? So I think the important thing is when you get to the end and you finish spraying, is that you do that again, right? So you turn it on, put your finger over, and then you release the air underneath. Do that a couple of times, and it will just stop the moisture being stuck in the system. Uh, and you don't want that in the system. If you plug your hose in, and you put your airbrush on and you turn it on, any liquid that's there, any moisture, it's just gonna blow it straight in. The first time that comes out, you'll be blowing moisture into your mold. Those chocolates will come out very dull, probably very lumpy. You'll dilute your cocoa butter that's in there um, and you'll find it will just spray all over the place and it's, it's kind of not pretty. And the worst thing is it's never an end mold, it'll be like number four or number five, right in the middle of the mold. And you have no option, you know, to try and shell around that, it's very, very difficult. So, um, I mean, doing those controls, I think that's really, really important. So, what other questions have we got? Um, watching from Charleston, South Carolina. Do you use uh, Do you use gels with Arga as a filling? Oh, Mark, I did see your I did see your message. Um, I'll get back to you on that one. I do. Let me show you what's happening. Um, I've got up there, so up there I've got, I've got pectin, I've got agar, I've got a product called inulin, um, which is a root fiber, but it's a very good, um, it's a very good um, thick enough for me that I use. I've got iota carrageenan, which I use as well. Um, if I'm honest, for the chocolates and for what I'm producing, Pectin is the big one for me. I think to make something that's a, a pate de fruit, um, sweet spot, spot for me is to use 4% of pectin. Um, I do use I do use gels, um, certainly at the hydrocolloids. So, you know, the, the, the problem with form, the problem with making a gel is if you're using something like Ultratex, uh, which is um, it's tapioca starch, which just, it absorbs the water um, it absorbs the water and thickens it, creates a gel. Um, very pleasing, very good if you're plating something. The problem is when you put it into a chocolate, uh, there's lots of air trapped in it. And what happens is you put the ganache on top and then it expands. So very often you find if you try and do, you try and cheat and make a quick gel with like Ultratex or a starch or something like that, you'll blow all the caps off your chocolate or worse, when you post them and they get them the other end, uh, they'll all split open. Because that 
air that gets trapped in. Now the interesting thing with, with pectin is, because it sets so quickly and it sets hard, and the sugar content, you stop the bacterial growth, but then not much air is trapped in, in uh, pate de fruit. So pectin, I think, is a good one for me. But Mark, I'll, I'll answer you separately like that. I know you asked for a couple of recipes, so I'll ping some over to you in terms of what I do for that one. Um, but like, um, I love pate de fruit. It is, you know, um, or PDF. I called it PDF the other day, and somebody said a file. Um, I've looked at, uh, so Mother Baker, I've looked at a few recipes and they all contain so much chemical like dextrose, sorbitol. I know they use them for taste texture. Do you really need glucose and dextrose? Right, dextrose is just a sugar. Uh, glucose is a sugar. The one I use is, use is made from, I think, potato. Um, they are posh names for sugars. Sorbitol is a, it's, it's a natural product. Um, what they do is they grab hold of water. And if once you once you start looking at shelf life, and you need to do your research on shelf life, what I'm trying to do is stop the water activity. And to give you an idea, the water gets microscopic, and I'll I'll describe what's. I'll, let me just describe what's happening here because this is really important. The bacteria needs food, warmth, and uh, moisture. If the ganache is at room temperature in a chocolate, um, we're already there, aren't we? The food's in there. Uh, in terms of if you're using cream, if you're using butter, if you're using sugars, you know there are there are bacteria that will grow in a in a in a sugar solution, um, and then you've got water. Well, the bacteria breed; they give off gases and excrement, and what that what that's got to do is make it through that water barrier, right? And that's where the but that's where the bacterial activity happens. With um, with the, the sugars, what they do is they, they create this barrier so that nothing will go through that barrier. And that's what water, basically that's what water activity is. We don't want water moving around and it happens microscopically. Um, so, you know, and I, I think it's something silly like, you know, 200,000 bacteria can fit on a pinhead. Well, if we can just control the water activity, um, the, the texture will come because there's no water activity. So you use too much glucose, it'll be chewy. You use too much sorbitol, um, it'll be very, very firm. I know that people say that um, sorbitol can cause um, a laxative. Actually, it is a laxative, actually, sorbitol. It's used, it's, it, if you go and look for it in the chemist, it's, 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 it's under all the laxatives. Uh, it'd be, that's a lot. You would need to take a lot. The amount that we're actually putting into chocolate some people do have adverse reactions to it. If you are going to use sorbitol, same as there's one called um, glucol as well. There's lots of different trade names for this stuff. Um, sorbitol, glucose, um, they have their uses. I don't think that they are, um, I don't think that they're nasty chemicals. I think there's far worse. When you look at all the E numbers and you look at the colorings and you, you know, I use azo free, um, cocoa butters um, so and all the colors see all the pastry stuff that I've been to, using today they're all natural you know they're as free I think that's the important thing the sugars if you want to start getting uh, past your shelf life you're gonna need some of those sugars certainly where you're using fruit juices um, as your main flavoring salt caramel as an example the sugar content is really high the fat content is very high um, and there's virtually no water content, and I think you know somebody quoted to me recently they could get you know nine months out of a um, a, a, a balanced salt caramel recipe. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. That stuff lasts um, ages. But I think you know glucose glucose adds elastin to things as well. Glucose can help emulsify things. Glucose is a fixer of many things. It stops crystals forming. Um, so it's not an acid chemical, it's, 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 it's a sugar, it's, it's an inverted sugar, uh, one of many that are available to you. Um, and the more that you use, and the stronger the inverted sugar that you use, the lower the AW becomes, uh, until you get to a point where it's virtually dry matter. Uh, but I hope that answers you, Mother Baker. I think the amounts that we're using, you know, I think they are worth it in terms of getting the right texture and getting the right shelf life and getting the right balance. The right balance of the right balance of texture in a ganache will give you the right flavour. And that's 
you know, and and if it's not, if it doesn't taste good, there's no point in doing it. That's the other thing, right? Um, what else? I made some dark passion fruit, but it wasn't quite right. Uh, passion fruit, dark chocolate, not my favourite. Milk chocolate, yeah, dark chocolate, yeah, not always, not not a hit with me. Um, Andy joins. Um, who else have we got? Any chocolate shop recommendations in London? Um, so, hope chocolate. You already spoke to me today. Oh, today, yesterday, I don't know. Um, I've been a bit slow in getting messages back. Um, I know you're going to Harrods. That is that's that's just worth a look at. There's another guy called William Curley, and I think he's got a shop in Mayfair, and I think there's another one in Richmond. Um, that's definitely worth looking at. He's um, I worked with William way back in the in the mid '90s, but incredibly talented. Um, but yeah, William Curley, give him a look. I'm not sure if he's open with the restrictions and all the rest of it, but Harrods you will absolutely love and spend as long as you want in there because it's just, yeah, it is absolutely incredible. Um, what's that, Mother? But yeah, we, um, I need to get through some of these questions, isn't I? Um, looking nice, something scrumptious. Um, so. Uh, they're good fruit bouquets. Um, I'm sorry I didn't catch it, but if you, how do you get them so shiny? Um, shiny chocolates. Polish these. I use. Um, I use, said this last week. I use injector swabs, which are uh, tiny little packets. They're injector swabs. Um, it's isopropyl alcohol and water. Um, I don't polish them all the time I tend to do it every kind of fourth go uh, but I do like squeaky clean mold so leaving them and reusing them and redo it without them mm, it doesn't really do it for me I just not from that background of doing that it's stuffy either squeaky clean or we're you know anyway um, they need polishing um, the more you polish them the smoother they will get um, so cotton pad Give it a buff out. Uh, give it a warm with a hair dryer first if you want to, and it will get. Uh, yeah, put the little uh, little cotton pads. You see that one? Just little cotton pads. Give them a buff. Isopropyl. Give them white. Um, allow that to dry. Uh, the other tip I'd say is if you're going to spray, if you give these a, if you give these a wipe out, right? You what you're doing there is you're creating static. <laughs> one of the videos on my grid I'll let you, you'll see I think it's uh, yeah I went to paint and I just had an absolute disaster so you'll create static in there so just leave it to stand for 20, 30, 40 minutes uh, until the static's gone and then you can spray um, the shine comes from well tempered cocoa butter uh, you need to heat your temperatures you need to heat your temperatures of the mould the middle of the mould there very often there's this little um, plastic dent in the middle here on both sides, that's the bit you need to measure this. Um, mine, I like around about 19 degrees. That's that that works for me. Tempered, right temperature mold, right temperature cocoa butter. Um, allow it to set. Um, very good tempering of your chocolate in terms of its fluidity. Filling the mold neat and tidily. Turning it out, shelling it, letting it rest, chilling it, letting it retract. The the shine comes from many doing many many things right. Um, and you need to get all of them right, and this is where the practice, I think, is important. So, um, do you need lemon juice or glucose to prevent crystallisation when making dry caramel? Uh, I don't ever have an issue with uh, caramel crystallising. I put sugar straight to a pan. Use a you need the heavy based pan. Um, you find the patterns in the shops that got a copper, but they're stainless steel, but they've got a copper base on it. Um, I use those. Always stainless steel, don't use aluminium, don't use Teflon, it doesn't work. And it does crystallise if you try and use Teflon. So buy yourself a um, buy yourself a heavy bottomed, copper bottomed if you can, um, stainless steel pan to make caramel. Uh, it will change your life. And buy the longest whisk that you can get. Um, I don't use lemon juice, I don't use anything like that, don't need to. Um, let's go. So I understand that they're both sugars. My query is, do you really need them? Uh, no, you don't really need them, but with them, you'll extend your shelf life. And if you're making them to eat yourself, 
you don't need them. You can just make a really good ganache, right? If you are making them to post them, and there's gonna be some time, you need to tell the customers how long they would last. And I think telling customers these, these have got two weeks shelf life is reasonable. Um, if it's gonna be more than that, tell them, but you need to work that out. The only way you can work that out is to track back with your recipe um, and find a recipe that's already got an AW and see how yours measures up. And then, you know, as I said, if you're sending these out to the public, you're inspected by an EHO, you need to prove that you've got some backup for the shelf life of your product. You don't want an EHO saying to you, so an environment health officer, yes, you can sell the chocolates, you can only put five days on them because it might not get to the customer in that time. So, which color brand we need for chocolate making in Pakistan? Do you know, in pa um, Zyra, I don't know what brands are available there. I think you probably need to get them shipped in. Um, there's some good stuff in Dubai. Uh, there's a couple of outlets in Dubai that are selling some um, Abu Dhabi as well, actually. Um, I think, you know, you, I don't know what's available in your part of the world. I don't have a favourite brand of cocoa butter. I've used many. There's none that I dislike. There's some that I prefer more than others in terms of the colour. Um, I don't have a favourite brand. I think they're all good. You know, there's, I've got one by, there's one here by, um, I think it's called Squire's Kitchen. Their gold and their bronze and their blue are fantastic and they're not a big international brand. They're a small shop that's based, you know, somewhere somewhere in Hampshire. Um, but the Squire's Kitchen, a couple of the colours, a little bit little bit um, a little bit light for me, but they're they're bronze the bronze that they make is really, really good. So I keep buying that one and I you know, IBC I I always buy the white because I like that one. Um Depends, you know. It's difficult for us to get to try and get hold of um, to try and get hold of Chef Rubber here in the UK is is silly money. So, um, that, yeah, I, I'd have a look. You know, I'd have a look and maybe maybe you know find one of the big five star hotels and speak to the pastry chef there. They might be able to give you some advice on that one. So, um, okay. Any other questions? Because I need to. What time have we got? We've been on. 50 minutes. Um, anybody got anything else that they want to ask at all? I will post this onto ITV a bit later on. Uh, there are some videos on my uh, there's some videos on my YouTube channel under the same name, So Sassy Chocolate. So um, I think we talk about um, splatter. I think there's some stuff. I will put a video up, or I will, I will make a video about setting up um, a spray brush. Uh, sorry, compressor and some spray brush controls. Um, but any questions, let me know. I'll probably do another one in a week or so. Uh, tomorrow I've got to get ready for a, a very important party. Um, is kicked cocoa. How come your chocolate is so fluid to get it the correct temperature but it's never as fluid as yours? I use Calibert. Um, you, know, you know when I turn the shell out, the, the, the narrower these are and the deeper they are, the slower the chocolate comes out, right? Whereas if you had a bonbon that's a dome and very, very flat, when you turn it out, it, I mean, it just drops out in seconds. So mine, mine is kind of middle of the road. The fluidity will be the same in all the caliber chocolates. Um, the 811, the 823, I've been using it 25 years. I think it's pretty much the same every time. Um, fluidity... I don't know what I don't know what your working temperature is. You know, for anybody that's melted chocolate in a microwave, you look at it at twenty eight degrees and it's kind of lumps in it. You look at it at twenty nine degrees and it's a little bit liquidy. Uh, and once you get to thirty one and thir 30, 31, you can you can really see the changes in the fluidity between thirty and thirty two. And it's only two degrees, but you know, from sixteen to twenty eight degrees. It doesn't seem to be much change, it's just a ball of chocolate, isn't it? So fluidity can change at, you know, at 31.6, there will be a noticeable difference between 31.6 and 31. So it's not a major problem just to push that temperature up a tiny bit. When I say a tiny bit, half a degree. All right. Cakes and cocoa, hope that answers that. Um, all right. Oh, try and get Instagram to work. Um, Mother Baker, thank you for your time, informative. Yeah, do you not love doing this? It's good fun to share. Um, another chocolate escalator. If I have a chocolate ganache recipe that's supposed to be slabbed, 
do I just increase the liquid ratio? No, slabbed, slabbed ganache is one thing. Um, slab ganache is one thing. You want something that's pipeable. Um, slab ganache as well tends to be huge recipes, all right? So I would work on your, I'd work on your own recipes. Um, slab chocolate is a very different thing. It's a certain texture so that it can be cut neatly. It's a certain temperature so that, um, sorry, it's a certain th um, uh, firmness so that it can be cut and so that it can be enrobed as well. And, you know, I, I think slabbed, I know what you're talking about, which is take somebody else's recipe and see if that works for you. I think you'll find it's just a little bit too firm. What happens with a lot of the slabbed uh, recipes is they firm up very, very quickly, then they're enrobed, and then what happens over a period of time, they soften down a tiny bit. Uh, they tend to have a, a lot of glucose in them uh, because they're trying to manipulate, you know, what they're doing. So, um, thank you. Happy birthday for my daughter tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, how do I get that so shiny? You've answered that one. Um, Chef, do you seed yet? Yeah, seeding method. Um, under 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 three kilos, I will seed. Uh, over that, I'll use my creo. Um, okay, I am gonna go. Uh, cheers, guys. I'll post this onto IGTV, uh, IGTV a little bit later on, um, and I'll probably save it and cut some bits and see if I can make something that's about the compressor. Uh, if you've got any questions, certainly ping me a message. And if you have a look at my um, YouTube channel, it's under the same name as, as uh, So Sassy Chocolate. Uh, there's some videos on there. Uh, give it a like, give it a follow, that'd be helpful. Um, and uh, thank you for tuning in. And I will speak to you all soon. Have a lovely, lovely, lovely weekend.